Good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Thanks for joining this webinar in our NACW virtual series. This is Jennifer Weiss with the Climate Action Reserve, and I'm just doing a quick kickoff here to start the webinar, and I'm going to turn it right around to Craig Ebert, who is president of the Climate Action Reserve. Thank you, Jenny, and thank all of you for joining us today. We're going to have a, a fascinating webinar here on taking full stock of the opportunities and challenges around reforestation. Um, as many of you know, uh, we were originally attending a discussion of these types of topics at our annual conference, which was going to be held in San Francisco. And something that you may have heard about called the COVID pandemic kind of intervened and, and disrupted that plan. So uh, we've uh, uh, been pleased to hold a series of these uh, webinars on critical issues of our time. And uh, we've got a fabulous panel today to talk about uh, uh, the issues around uh, reforestation. Um, next slide, please, Jenny. Before we dive into it, I did want to take this opportunity to thank the uh, many sponsors and exhibitors that have supported uh, the reserve over the years with the North American Carbon World uh, effort. Uh, the, you know, these companies really are great partners in making sure that uh, we can put on, you know, the, the premier climate policy event in North America. Uh, and despite the recent disruptions that we're all contending with, uh, I just, you know, we really do appreciate uh, all the support that they've shown. Um, now, without further ado, next slide, please. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to introduce just a fabulous panel we, we've got today. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, Anastasia Baer, who's a uh, technology and sustainability leader for Dow. We also have Lisa Gonzalez Kramer, who's an environmental scientist and project manager for California State Parks. We also have Jeremy Mannion, uh, who's the lead of forestry, carbon markets, and natural climate solutions at the Arbor Day Foundation. Those three represent our, our the fabulous panelists for today. And now I want to turn it over to our moderator, who's PJ Marshall. She's the founder and executive director of Restore the Earth. So PJ, over to you. Thanks, Craig. And, and hello, everyone. Jenny just said we have about 200 folks joining us today. That's, that's amazing. So we really want to thank the North American Carbon World for this virtual series, and of course, particularly this one on the challenges around reforestation, opportunities and challenges around reforestation. So for what we're finding is for any organization or corporation that's addressing the future of karma, uh, addressing future carbon neutral goals, landscape scale restoration is really a cost effective and simple nature based solution to removing carbon out of the atmosphere. And if you look at reforestation along with grasslands and wetlands, there really is the ability to provide for one third of the carbon emission reduction goals for the 2030 uh, Paris Agreement. And recently with the Trillion Tree Initiative rolling out at the World Economic Forum, all of a sudden, there's been a big buzz and promotion about mobilizing funding and support for restoring our forest. So we're gaining opportunities for funding, and we're also gaining some innovative approaches for accounting and for uh, forecasting and, uh, and accrediting related to uh, carbon and carbon um, emissions. However, Lisa, in 2019 out in California, with forest fires, there was a loss of about 4.7 million acres of forest. And then in 2018, you lost another 8 million plus acres of forest, which are really overwhelming numbers. But I'd really like you to share how the California State Parks has been Respond, trying to respond and responding to these disasters. And in particular, and you ready for this, the Kiamaka Rancho, <laughs> Rancho State Park uh, Reforestation Initiative. So thank you, PJ. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Great. Thank you uh, so much. I want to thank the Climate Action Reserve and uh, everybody here on the, the panel for uh, putting together such a great uh, topic. And um, I'm going to just jump right in here. So um, the Cuyamaca Rancho State Park uh, Reforestation Project has been a project that started uh, in 2007. So 
Uh, we're going on 13 years now of um, experience uh, with forest carbon uh, uh, project. Um, I want to just give a little bit of background on, on the project itself, and then I'll, I'll address some of your, your other questions regarding currently uh, what's going on uh, as far as responses to the wildfires. Um, so, uh, and the other thing I'm, I'm trying to do is gonna just, I'm gonna dive into this uh, in a little more detail, just because I think uh, reforestation uh, projects, um, the complexity of them aren't maybe quite as understood as, um, as other carbon projects. So I wanna dive into this just a little bit. So uh, the Quimaca Rancho State Park reforestation project was initiated uh, in the aftermath of the 2003 uh, Cedar Fire. And uh, the Cedar Fire burned over uh, 273,000 acres in San Diego County. Uh, it was the largest wildfire in California's recorded history for 14 years. And, uh, and as part of that fire, it burned through our 25,000 acre park at a high intensity over thousands of contiguous acres. Um, the, the fire itself was catastrophic in many ways, including loss of life and property. But in terms of ecosystem health, uh, we describe it as catastrophic because of its high intensity over a large contiguous acre or area. Um, the park uh, had almost 10,000 acres of forest habitat at the headwaters of uh, three San Diego uh, watersheds, San Diego County watersheds uh, prior to the fire. And the fire burned virtually everything down to bare mineral soil. Uh, it incinerated the seed bank that uh, normally holds the, that is the forest duff that holds the seeds in that forest litter uh, for regeneration. And it also destroyed the forest canopy, uh, which would normally produce more seeds. So uh, post-fire studies uh, in the park indicated uh, that about 95% of the, of the conifers, the cone-bearing trees, were killed during that fire. Uh, so there really was no way for the forest to naturally regenerate on its own. It's lost the canopy and the seed bank. Um, however, parks at the time uh, expected the forest to recover on its own. Uh, we had never experienced a fire like this. So, you know, park's mission is to preserve and protect California's natural resources, uh, at least that's part of its mission. And in previous fires, uh, there had been patches of forest that burned at lower intensity or not at all. So there were ways for the forest to, to recover previous to this. In Cuyamaca, however, this was the first time that the forest could not recover uh, to, to, any, to any degree. Um, so California State Parks deemed it a priority to restore our Sky Island forest habitat in 2007. And we initiated uh, that, uh, our reforestation project at that time. And um, so just, just as a side note, um, this is where our action varied from the baseline of business as usual. We stepped in to say, okay, we've lost too much of this resource and, and it's, it's so important that we do need to restore this. And that's the additionality that's a requirement of every forest carbon project. So um, we initiated the, the project in 2007 with the goal of restoring about 25% of the pre-fire forest habitat. Um, uh, we are planting uh, in a mosaic of restored uh, areas. And then as the trees mature, uh, we are expecting that these restored areas will act as centers of seed dispersal and will assist with additional recovery of the Sky Island forest over time. Um, so we mimic a complex uh, relationship between the different uh, vegetation types, including pine oak woodlands, montane chaparral, grasslands, meadows, and really make it uh, an ecosystem mosaic as it would have been, uh, as it was before, before, the, um, before the fire. Um, so, I want to talk about the, the project was initiated in 2007 and it was with the help of uh, a sister agency, CAL FIRE, and in conversation with the Climate Action Reserve, who, uh, which at the time was revising the forest project protocol to include uh, projects on pu pu public land. So that had not been possible to do a public land project before 2007 and they were revising the protocol so that 
at, at that time. So we were able to take advantage of that as well. And we were also in conversation at that time with our first funding partner, uh, American Forest. So it's a synergy of all of these things coming together at the same time that really allowed us to um, find ways to restore our our um, Sky Island habitat at the headwaters of these watersheds in San Diego County. Um, I, I say all of those things because um, it's uh, reforestation uh, projects are complex. And uh, for anyone doing a, a forest carbon project, that's part of our conversation here. How do you get these projects funded? How do you replicate uh, projects like this reforestation project that's been now uh, registered? We registered in 2012. Uh, we listed in 2000, uh, I think it was nine. And so we um, have been in this conversation of reforestation for quite some time. Um, but, uh, and I don't want to miss your question here uh, about what about the current wildfires? What are we doing uh, regarding restoration or mitigation in response to these current wildfires? And I want to say that essentially state parks and state owned land in, in the state of California, uh, forest lands um, are owned, you know, roughly 3% of the, the forests in California are owned by state agencies or local parks, uh, waters, uh, water districts. 3% uh, of that 33 million acres of forest in California is state owned. Um, the majority is under uh, federal jurisdiction, the US Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, things like that. And then 40% or so is uh, owned by uh, families or uh, tribes and companies. So um, it really, in terms of how California is responding to these uh, catastrophic fires, um, there's been quite a lot of movement and really good uh, processes put in, been, have been put in place or uh, strengthened, uh, existing processes strengthened. So we have a, an initiative that um, has come down through legislation to uh, increase the pace and scale of, uh, of, of, for example, prescribed burning across the state of California. So um, it's a number, uh, it's a large um, effort uh, and it's uh, joined by many partners, including um, US for Forest Service and state agencies and local agencies. Everybody who has any uh, uh, ability to impact the health of forests is all um, get, are gathering together in uh, uh, to to promote the um, California Forest Carbon Plan, which specifically addresses the emissions of um, carbon and the sequestration of carbon in our forest in California. So kind of a, a long answer for uh, a lot of nuanced uh, a, a question. But, but let's, before we move on to uh, uh, Jeremy, I wanted to get a sense of how you've been able to attract the kind of funding that's required to do this kind of large scale reforestation and and what incentives have you been able to bring to the table to really attract the kind of and i'm assuming private as well as public funding to really get these initiatives underway sure sure thank you so um i would say the the way that we um were able to get our project funded and and this is this really leads into uh, part of the opportunities and challenges uh, of reforestation and the lessons learned over over time. So um, it is very difficult uh, and had been, uh, I think, one of the greatest challenge for reforestation uh, projects, uh, carbon projects, to be initiated uh, in, in the last 10 years. Um, our, our project, um, uh, like I said, it was coalescence of uh, a number of different factors and forward-thinking people in many respects. So, in a in a reforestation project, um, a, the the challenge is to uh, fund your work or get your work funded, and then um, if it's through a carbon agreement, that uh, carbon credit is not issued until uh, the forest actually has grown and then is measured and the, the credits are issued after they're verified. So 
the the initial investment in many cases had to be a, a large investment upfront with a very long time of waiting. And in fact, our project has a 100 year crediting period. And so uh, that's, that's one of the issues, the, the challenges around reforestation projects is to uh, enlist uh, funders, people interested or corporations interested in putting that money up front to help do the, the work that's required and wait for the credits. And so that is unique. Our project was very unique in that we were able to attract funders partly because of the co-benefits uh, of, of this project being, uh, you know, at the headwaters of uh, three watersheds and the uh, Sky Island forests that were uh, virtually disappearing, um, um, partially, mostly as a result of this fire. Um, and of course, you know, other co-benefits as well um, that weren't measured at the time, but were understood by the funders uh, who um, are, are funding partners uh, in the carbon project. Um, agreements. Uh, I would say that is an unusual and very difficult um, uh, scenario to replicate uh, for many for reforestation projects. And so that is one reason uh, why this climate forward uh, program that the Climate Action Reserve has initiated is really essential for allowing projects like ours to be replicated across the, the larger landscape. Um, I think the other the other part about um, that's difficult for attracting funders uh, is the fact that uh, reforestation and, and carbon credits in general, but especially reforestation credits, are more expensive and more expensive than than any other um, carbon credits that that are, are available. And um, I think the 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 challenge for us and the opportunity for us is to be the be um, able to communicate uh, the the costs effectively communicate the costs involved in actually uh, managing these car these forests as carbon sinks, but also as ecosystems and all of the co benefits that are uh, that come out of that. So, in terms of um, uh, you know communicating those benefits, uh, the, I think that's part of the way that we uh, also uh, begin to uh, inform people that when you have a forest, um, everybody needs to remember that a forest essentially breathes and it's essentially accumulating biomass every moment. And so every moment that, uh, that uh, biomass accumulates, that uh, presents challenges for uh, managing those in a healthy way. And every every forest and every person in California now needs to understand that in order to prevent the emission of black carbon through these catastrophic wildfires, we need to spend the money up front to manage our ongoing, manage our reforestation projects. And that's part of ex the expense of reforestation over time as well. Yeah, yeah. I, we, I, we all agree. And I think that that I'd like to, looking at California, that I'd like to really bring Jeremy in because the Arbor Day Foundation has been helping organizations and corporations respond positively to looking at their climate goals and to solve sustainable development challenges. And they're looking at reforestation, you know, as one of the options. So Jeremy, uh, what possibilities and opportunities are you seeing opening up for these organizations and corporations to make greater commitments, have better awareness and understanding, and they can make these investments in reforestation as a part of their carbon emission portfolios. Yeah, thanks, PJ, and uh, great job, Lisa, starting us off. A um, little bit of background, just real quick before I go into your questions on the Arbor Day Foundation, for those that aren't familiar, we're, we're, our mission is to inspire people, plant, nurture, and celebrate trees. And it's our vision to uh, use and recognize trees as a solution to some of the most complex global problems today, like climate change, like poverty, like deforestation. And so I think to, to, your, to your question, PJ, I think what we've been doing, Arbor Day has been working in reforestation for almost 50 years, um, with our 50th anniversary in 2022. And um, we started working in, in the voluntary carbon markets around reforestation starting around 2012. And our, our model there has been to work with some of the highest quality project developers 
um, folks like Green Trees in the United States, uh, Eco Tierra, and Taking Root in Canada, they're doing agroforestry projects in, in Nicaragua and Peru to really enhance their activities. And so we've been taking um, funds that we raise from our individual members and our, our corporate donors to help enhance the tree planting activities on these verified carbon projects. And then on the back end of that, when it comes to off-taking of the credits, we work with over 200 different corporations um, that are that are looking for ways to uh, set you know carbon neutrality goals, now transitioning to net zero and climate positive goals as well, and looking at ways to use verified uh, forestry carbon credits as a, as a way to, to get there for emissions that are hard to address right now. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing is just trying to demystify the current options that exist related to reforestation today. And we have our, uh, so we have non-market-based mechanisms and market-based mechanisms that can address those, those things. And what we're really trying to do is understand what a business's uh, goal is and try to find the right type of reforestation to fit that goal. And we've kind of drawn four main uh, types of reforestation so far. Um, the first two are non-market-based solutions. So, um, doing community tree plantings and distribution events um, in, in cities and in suburbs and in towns around the US and around the world. And these are good, good opportunities for, for corporations to get their employees and customers engaged in tree planting activities and in green infrastructure projects in more urban environments. The second type is um, looking at large scale reforestation of, of, of public lands. Um, so federal, state, county level lands, uh, working with folks like Lisa to make sure that we can drive additional funding to high quality projects. Um, and a lot of our, our partners goals there are, are really around um, looking at uh, watershed health, biomass accounting, um, buy one, plant one programs. Uh, we work with Radio Flyer every time they, uh, every, someone, every time someone buys a wagon online with them, they, they plant a tree. So those are the two, first two, and then the other two are kind of now, the, now we're getting to the, the carbon markets. Um, and we see the, the, the climate forward program, like, like you talked about, uh, Lisa and TJ, these, these forward looking units um, that are designed to address future emissions. Um, we're still kind of navigating through that, that process quite candidly. Um, we see some good potential on public lands. I think our, what we're trying to figure out is how do, how do um, companies appropriately make claims with these future emission profiles. Um, and so we're working through those with, with, folk, with people like the folks on the call today. And then, um, then we have like the verified ex post credits, which you know, the mission's already taken, the mission removal's already taken place. And that's the work we've been doing with, with Green Trees and Eco Tierra and, and taking root. And really that's where we're focusing on you know, climate neutrality goals, carbon removal goals, uh, transitioning out of net zero goals, and looking at, at, at verified ways companies um, can invest, not only in the offtake of the credits, but helping us create new supply moving forward. And so um, we've, just, we've just seen that there's lots of confusion in the different ways that companies can participate in reforestation. And so we just try to have a good understanding of how to best um, find the right type of reforestation for the right type of business goal. Um, so some things that, that we're seeing that, that we're taking kind of special note of uh, for corporations right now is we're seeing this kind of shift um, in the market from, from companies that have been participating in buying reforestation carbon credits to not just want to offtake the credits, but to find a way to help us expand these projects, help us find ways to plant more trees, help us find ways to quantify water benefits more that's happening in these watersheds. Um, and so with that happening, we're seeing opportunities to start to be able to stack investments and for different departments at corporations to be able to kind of stack their goals together, um, not only on the, the carbon front, but on the uh, water replenishment, the quality and quantity side, um, and then also tree planting goals. So the OneTree.org initiative, we're seeing more and more corporations in addition to their carbon commitments, also setting tree planting goals as well as trying to align uh, to preserve uh, large tracts of acreage or hectares as well. Um, so that's, that's, that's one thing we're kind of sensing is, is this trying to find ways to, to, to Lisa's point of, you know, not only thinking about the carbon, which is what we transact these credits on, but all the other co-benefits, getting, getting much more detailed and quantifying and telling that story, um, which helps companies validate these investments and want to do greater, greater things moving forward. Jan, um, 
you know, when they look at it, it's the value of all these co-benefits that any of these healthy ecosystems bring to the table. And and I know that Anna, Anna, uh, from Dow's standpoint, as the official carbon partner of the International Olympic Committee, through that partnership, actually, um, you'll be the very first reforestation project adding to the carbon, the forest carbon stock, uh, to be registered on the uh, CAR climate, on the Climate Action Reserves Forward Crediting Reforestation Program, and so. You know, working with the IOC, you're bringing late, the latest technologies, you know, the hard technologies to the table. And what role do you see in how reforestation and nature-based solutions fit into that strategy where you're adding to stock and you're, and you're making the investment in something that's obviously being generated over a period of time? Hmm. Yeah, thanks, PJ, and thanks, uh, thanks, Lisa and Jeremy. Um, I think I'm gonna probably repeat a lot of the sentiments that you've shared already. Um, but uh, just a, a little bit as far as our um, partnership with the International Olympic Committee and with the Olympic Movement, Dow has been um, a carbon partner for the Olympic Movement in three different, or um, I should say, separate iterations of the program, starting in, back in 2014 with Sochi Games and then repeating the program with Rio Organizing Committee. And now, um, as you mentioned, PJ, we are the official carbon um, partner of the International Olympic Committee, which basically is responsible for, or you know, it's, it's the, the head governing body of the Olympic movement. And what we've, um, the reason we kind of got engaged in that um, opportunity was that we recognized the power that sport has um, to bring people together and unite them uh, against the uh, um, you know common common goal right or towards achieving a common goal and also just the uh, sheer um, excellence you see in Olympic athletes right um, I mean it's what was it the number that I heard uh, 0 0.003 percent of population something like that 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 that's um, the number of Olympic athletes out there so it's incredible the amount of work you have to put in to be up at that level, right? So uh, being able to partner with an organization that has that high standard of achievement and support their um, sustainability goals, especially around carbon, has been extremely rewarding, but also I, I would, I would um, admit also stressful at times and challenging, right? Because you are in the spotlight a lot. Um, and, but Regardless, I think the program has been extremely successful. And PJ, to your point, Dow is a technology supplier, right? We are a big materials company. Um, and from that standpoint, we have a, a very broad reach across a whole bunch of different value chains and products. We touch so many products that um, it's kind of hard to even count them. Um, and from that standpoint, we do have an opportunity to enable transition, or at least, you know, to some extent, help enable transition to um, cleaner and lower carbon technologies. But what we've also realized in running this program and working with our customers and supply chain to, to drive adoption of those low carbon technologies over the years, we've realized also that um, we also need more um, or additional focus on nature-based solutions, mainly because when you think about, say, insulation and you put it on the house and the house uses less um, energy to operate, right? Um, you're reducing your emissions in the future, but you're not capturing anything out of the atmosphere that's currently there, right? And so that was the thought that when we uh, found this project with you guys with Restore the Earth, um, it and and it was shovel ready. Um, it 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 clicked. It it made sense to be able to incorporate in, in our portfolio based approach to carbon uh, mitigation program, where you know there's there's a bunch of different directions that we're trying to um, influence in the space of carbon uh, carbon mitigation. And part of this, so I want to kind of also support what Lisa and Jeremy have shared so far. Uh, one of the critical elements was the fact that this project allowed us to articulate the uh, uh, co-benefits of the carbon reduction and the, and the reforestation project in Louisiana. 
where we do have facilities, we do have production facilities in Louisiana. And uh, for us being able to quantify um, and, and pursue opportunity in the water quality space, um, specifically to Jeremy's point, was one of the internal value add to the fact that it generates carbon reductions. Um, I want to mention also the fact that um, the, the other attractive feature, I would say, is um, also in the innovative approaches. So the whole carbon partnership with the IOC has been uh, one of the innovations that we've put out there into the world. Uh, we've developed a carbon framework um, for mitigating carbon footprint of events, which is free for anybody to use. So we didn't protect it for that same reason that we're trying to enable the transition to a cleaner world, right, or, or a lower carbon world. Um, and then from that, it, it, it's, you know, it's the carb, um, DAOs, that was one of the DAOs pillars is innovation. And so when we saw also this opportunity to support this innovative accounting mechanism that, as you all pointed out, um, you know, is set up to help drive investment into reforestation, and, and I would generalize it even more broadly into nature-based solutions, right, uh, with the, with the um, uh, climate forward type of accounting methodologies, that, that was another uh, factor that really resonated with our group, but then even with the um, broader DAO community wanted to put a plug in for um, the DAO's nature goal as part of our 2025 sustainability goals. That was, um, you know, important alignment for us on the IOC carbon partnership side to make sure that we also um, contribute towards our nature goal, which is a unique um, goal to have for somebody like DAO. And compared to our peers, I think we're, we're unique in that situation that we are uh, looking to quantify the benefits that the corporation achieves through investments into green infrastructure or nature-based solutions. And so again, this project fits that bill, right? So what I was going through the checklist of internal value, external value, um, it just ended up piling up. And in Jeremy's term, right, it's stacked up kind of in terms of the investments uh, versus the return for both the DAO, the IOC, um, hopefully restore the earth as we hoping to uh, to bring in more visibility to that because that's kind of the whole point of working on the sports platform to make sure that all those sports fans and and those who care for that kind of uh, um, social endeavor you know they, they they see it and they appreciate it well and we're talking about some of the challenges one of the things that um, we've all kind of been confronted with or, or has been brought up over the last several weeks is as these kinds of greater awareness of the potential for reforestation you roll out a trillion tree program and a lot of those programs are one dollar one tree programs you know that that the challenge in looking at some of that is um, you know, the permanence of those uh, potential projects, you know, the yeah. stability around the globe in, in governments and in land ownership, et cetera. Um, Lisa, how have you had to address some of this where you are comparing, you know, programs, any tree going into the ground is of value, but those programs where folks want to make a major investment and they want it to be in something that's going to have impact not only locally and and nationally but maybe globally what they might look for related to a high quality reforestation project and jeremy i want you to chime in on this too uh, so that they know how to evaluate or or begin to inform themselves on a high quality reforestation project I don't know if we could hear you. Did we lose you? Oh, I'm here. Okay. Sorry, uh, I was muted, so uh, thanks. Um, so to um, so your question is about how we continue to um, interact with um, people that are interested in finding projects that are um, are, are going to be beneficial. Uh, in terms of the, the wide range of projects possibly available. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So I would say that um, especially as people are acting, uh, you know, 
well, let me start a little bit larger here. We in California have a number of municipalities that are in the process of beginning implementation on their climate action plan. So uh, in California, as many people know, we have uh, some really aggressive uh, climate sequestration and uh, uh, emission reduction goals. Um, uh, for the long term, I think it's 80% below 1990 levels by 20, 2050. So um, we met our 2020 goals uh, four years early, and uh, we're at the 2030 goals. We're working on 40% um, emission reduction below 1990 levels by 20. Uh, 2030. So as a result, that drives a lot of uh, the internal um, conversation, internal to the state, about how uh, local municipalities can assist or will be assisting based on their uh, climate action plans. So I, I really think that uh, statewide, especially, and, and certainly across the United States and around the world, there are um, a lot of opportunities for uh, nature-based solutions for uh, carbon projects using nature-based solutions um, and specifically reforestation. I would say that um, as somebody is looking uh, at specific opportunities, they would be looking for uh, things such as permanence uh, and we know that varies based on you know ecosystem as well as uh, location and and whether or not uh, that um, entity is uh, perhaps a state state owned or uh, is on conservation easement, easement and things like that. So um, I would say there, there's just a, a myriad of, um, of factors to look at. I, I would also um, also say that when looking for reforestation projects, um, the one thing that is not always understood is that uh, we're looking at reforestation uh, mostly. Uh, the reforestation projects are looking at ecosystem restoration, not specifically uh, optimizing for carbon. And so those co-benefits are going to be extremely important to consider as you evaluate, as a company evaluates uh, a project. Again, getting back to the measurement of those co-benefits. Um, this, this more than any other project, uh, reforestation, uh, has to encompass even more than than the uh, the carbon optimization, and so that's something uh, I think that is is not necessarily has not been well understood and is becoming more um, you know more understood as as we move along. Yeah, and I think Jeremy, it's in looking at the metrics for being able to account for the full value from an environmental, social, and economic standpoint. How are you advising, since you're looking at the stacking, how are you advising some of the folks that you're uh, interacting with and, and you're partnering with looking at, and in particular, uh, reforestation types of projects and the values that they can bring to the table? Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of Lisa's points. The permanency is one of the obviously key factors when it comes to restoring. Um, we feel really good about permanency, whether it's a philanthropic investment or carbon market investment on public lands, because whether it's you know the federal government or states, they have ongoing you know active active management plans to to maximize that ecosystem. To Lisa's point. Um, and so when it comes to engaging private landowners, um, you know, private landowners uh, across across the U.S. or something around, uh, you know, own, own two thirds of the land, 60 percent to two thirds of the land. And so that's where we've had to um, have incentives to get in place to, to, to make sure that those landowners can not only get paid for carbon, but also have other diversified income streams that keep those for us there for the project term and even longer. Um, and that comes, you know, in, in addition to the carbon, the, you know, payments for carbon, um, so some money for some selective harvesting of the trees. We usually do a very dense planting at first on a lot of our, our, our carbon projects in the Mississippi River Delta, for example, and then start thinning those, 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 those uh, trees out at about year 10 to 15 uh, and continue to manage that, that forest um, through year 40 to mimic a hardwood natural ecosystem. Um, so carbon credits, 
we have timber selective harvesting, we have um, folks coming to those private landowners uh, for, for recreational activities, hunting, fishing, hiking, camping. Um, and then there's money from the USDA for, for wetland and conservation protection. So when you start layering these income streams available for the landowners, um, that makes, that makes uh, that, that increases the level of permanence in addition to what the, the standards and methodologies are to acquire. And so we make sure that our, our corporate funders, our buyers and off takers of the, of the credits are, are understanding that look for things like how landowners are, are incentivized if it's on private lands for sure. Um, looking at the, the use of unique monitoring, reporting, and verification technologies um, as well. So there's a lot of advances happening right now with uh, remote sensing, satellite, image, satellite imagery, um, LIDAR, uh, different types of uh, picture taking services on the ground. Um, so these, these tools help us you know, not only give an experience, to uh, a corporate funder that might be sitting in a city somewhere and seeing a rural part of, of, of a forest, but also um, continuing to make sure that we can share the landowner's story, share the, the community story. Um, a lot of a lot of the folks that we work with um, in the Mississippi Delta, it's a very impoverished part of the country, uh, some of the poorest counties in the country, and so there's a, there's an environmental and social justice, equity justice here piece to it as well. Um, and, you know, we, we need to do better jobs uh, of tracking um, the economic impacts that, that exist with these, these reforestation projects, because ultimately rural economies, whether in the U.S. or internationally, they've been left out of a lot of economic gains over the last few decades. And so these, these, these folks are, are tending to the land and to keep that one third of the nature based solutions potential, we have to make sure that they're incentivized to do so. Yeah, and I, I which is really good and I mean it, it, that kind of accountability in your back pocket with with the appropriate metrics you know give uh, obviously demonstrates the values which are very high and unbelievable in some cases you know yeah, we've yeah. run out of the climate forward program and I just want to give a high level of this and I also I, I know I this isn't a commercial but I want to give a shout out to the climate action reserve for their 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 visionary innovative approach to this climate forward program but just a high overview, and then I want to ask Anna about this, is that it really, the Climate Forward Program, and, and specifically in reforestation, is an opportunity for a, a, a corporation or an organization who's looking at their strategies out into the future as to what their carbon emissions are going to be, and they want to have a program to reduce those carbon emissions in the future where they can make an investment and let's say specifically in reforestation so you're adding to the carbon stock and and by making that investment they um, have the ability to generate uh, forecasted mitigation units on the climate forward program where they're they're able to take credit for and account for the future emission reductions that are going to take place as it relates to their investment into this permanent uh, reforestation project. And so Anna, you, again, being the first to register a project on the uh, Climate Forward program and also looking at the metrics, the, you know, the stick in your back pocket to account for the impacts from an environmental, social, and economic standpoint, you want to speak a little bit more to how that was so the climate forward and the metrics were so appealing to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and again, I think that's that's uh, I don't know. I think it's probably somewhat unique to have three panelists uh, um, having a lot in common, even though we're coming from so many mm. different rights of from these diverse places. But we do kind of seem to agree on a lot of the path forward, which is amazing and exactly what's needed um, in this world, right? today in general, but yeah, speaking specifically on the forward counting or in general, this whole idea of, to Jeremy's point of economically feasible um, approaches of making carbon um, projects more, you know, based on economically feasible solutions to everyone um, that would also capture the societal benefits of different layers in there was absolutely critical. And in fact, that, that is one of the cornerstones of our carbon 
uh, mitigation framework for events that we've developed uh, was that recognition that, um, and, and you know, we did it years ago, that the uh, the existing carbon methodologies tend to limit um, developers to uh, projects and ideas that are, um, you know, they need um, financial investments and otherwise are not economically feasible. Yet there are situations and there are technologies like that insulation is one example, right? Where it's it's not it's it's pretty economically feasible, right? Everybody could go get more of it and put it in, but um, the people are not doing it still. So how do you incentivize more of, um, you know, your everyday potentially everyday solutions, right? You just have to do more of it, um, and that 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 future looking um, and ability to also educate and promote kind of doing more good today for the benefit of the future that that kind of overarching concept uh, really resonated again um, you know when we're looking at the project and the idea of being able to register it through the climate forward initiative um, seemed to align again with kind of the the overarching concept that was behind our climate mitigation framework um, in that in and and the way we put it is that it's um, the events are happening, um, you know, they plan the head, um, they are happening in the future, but and the mitigation strategies are being developed today for the future a lot of times. How do you leave a positive legacy once that's all done and finished, right? What do you do today to be able to say that the world is better because we existed today, right? 10 years later um, versus the other way around. Um, and so that was. Um, you know, the ability, and, and like I said earlier, um, the ability to also support to what we see as an innovation in that accounting uh, space, you know, um, it was it was aligned with the whole vision be behind a framework, behind a carbon partnership with the Olympics. Um, so it was one of those check boxes that the, the value to the overall program was was very clear. Um, and, and one of it, I wanted to kind of pause maybe a little bit more to um, what Jeremy was just talking about, the uh, social benefit, right? How that gets realized through reforestation projects. Um, I would say too that we've recognized it also through the uh, framework that we are operating under and even in the carbon accounting. So not talking even about other metric, but even within the carbon accounting uh, mechanisms, we've created the separate category of social benefits, which are um, you know, we, we, we try, again, it goes to the point of not every project will be, a, we, we will be able to verify down to, you know, decimal points, right? Um, some things are good to do, but you don't have yet that technology or maybe other ways to really go on the ground and really, you know, look at the, the measurement systems or your dials and, and, and I don't know, valves in there or count all the trees, but you still know you got to do it. So how do you quantify, right? So you feel like if it felt like this forward uh, framework, again, was very much aligned with our social benefit type approach where, you know, you do investment today, you quantify best you can, um, you should still get some credit, right? Um, and, and move forward with that. So I I know and I don't know uh, Jenny you need to tell us I know you wanted to allow this group could talk forever we could just keep going back and forth <laughs> but I, I don't know Jenny if you've got questions that have been popping up that we can uh, direct toward our panelists um, and then and then come back as well. Yeah, I, th this group definitely has some good dynamics and can continue talking for hours. Uh, there have been a couple of questions that popped up, so uh, we've got nine minutes left. Maybe I can share those, and then, like you said, PJ, if there's time, maybe you can address another point uh, with the panelists. So this first question um, was for Lisa. It came up when you were speaking. It's from Eva Hillman. Uh, are these planting projects registered in California or federally as a carbon project? So thank you for that question. Actually, these are registered uh, on the Climate Action Reserve under the Forest Carbon uh, Protocol version 3.2. Uh, and, and actually, all of our credits were, were have been purchased. Um, so there are no credits available at this point. We, um, 
actually structured our, our credits to be um, based on a percentage of what we will be um, sequestering over, like I said, the course of 100 years. So hope that helps. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so this next question, I, I've actually never heard this group speak on this topic before, so I'm not sure uh, if you'll have an answer to this. It's from Edwin Ott, and he asks, why is no one evaluating using trees to remove carbon from atmosphere, converting to charcoal, and then putting into permanent sequestration by burial? Well, if if he's asking, I, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but is if it's in a sustainable harvest where you have um, where you're basically potentially creating carbon emissions by harvesting biomass in a sustainable harvest, there is an option um, where you can, through pyrolysis, create biochar out of that uh, biomass and then spread the biochar um, among the acreage that has a potential, if it's done right, of, of uh, reducing the carbon emissions from the sustainable harvest. I mean, I'm kind of, it, if that was the question, Jeremy, you wanna address that? Is that something, is that how you heard the question? Yeah, that's, um, I, I'm not the best to talk about biochar quite candidly, but I, I am encouraged by the increased used increased use of sustainable forestry for long-term building products. Um, you know, we're starting to see now in the northwest part of the country and other parts of Europe um, using uh, timbers, uh, cross, -lamin cross laminated timbers that have been uh, produced responsibly and to, to build commercial buildings that, that have a lower overall footprint than a steel and concrete building. And that and the, when, it, when the harvest is done correctly, that carbon is stored in, in the wood products, whether it's in the timbers or in you know, furniture items, things like that. And so I'm, I'm very encouraged by the innovation that can be coming from sustainable forestry practices in the built environment because about 60% of our emissions or 70% of our emissions globally come from cities and how we, how we uh, live in buildings. Yeah, because I know there have been some challenges brought up from a global standpoint where there have been reforestation programs where then the, again, it didn't have the permanence, where then the forests were harvested after about you know seven years or so, so, and depending on, I mean, even when they were creating wooden poles or whatever, there was still like two thirds of the carbon emissions were still going out into the atmosphere. So it's, it's a challenge that I think we're all looking for effective ways of addressing. And we've, you know, we have the ability collectively to put our brains together to do that. This is Craig. I will just offer up that uh, here at the reserve, we are considering development of a biochar protocol. It's an interrelated issue, I think, with uh, issues associated, for example, avoided wildfire emissions and, and other natural working land solutions. So uh, no definitive you know, go yet on it, but it is an interesting question, and uh, we will be examining that in the months to come. Another innovative visionary okay. approach, Craig. <laughs> Jenny, Jenny, have any more questions? There is a question from Michael Ruby, and Michael, you may have had this question answered uh, because it's in regards to investment and forward crediting, and I believe that he asked it when the concept was first brought up during this webinar. And his question is, did I hear correctly that the purchaser of a forest credit receives the credits now but does not have to pay until the carbon is measured in the field, possibly as much as 100 years in the future? Uh, so maybe that had been clarified, but I just wanted to share it with the group in case you had anything you, you wanted to add to clarify that. I think I think the only clarification that I would have on that is, and Craig, you're the you can help me with this too, is that no, the the investment the investment is made up front, and the uh, ability to account for the uh, forecast and mitigation units are available up front, but the investment is required up front for the reforestation. That's our biggest challenge, is getting the investment in the reforestation to generate the offsets. 
I think it's just that the credits, the credits are also available up front, right? That's the difference between yeah, the, the units. Yeah, the forecast and mitigation units, we like to call them, but they're available Sorry, up yeah. front. Yeah, because because we projected out to determine what that forest in its permanence will generate after 40 at, at 40 years, even though it's a longer term project. And then they can account for those forecast and mitigation units up front. Yeah, I didn't know. Uh, I, I wanted to also chime in uh, just to make sure that what I, I had spoken about earlier was not uh, confused. Uh, so we were not registered under the Climate Forward program just because it wasn't available at the time. Uh, we did have the initial investments made, uh, you know, already, and the credits won't come to our investors our partners uh, until the last credit is issued at the 100 year mark. So that's that's a very unique situation and that's what uh, the Climate Forward program addresses. Yeah, and there are, and Jeremy, do you wanna, do you wanna speak? Cause I know you really have been uh, delving into a lot of these other options that you're seeing out there, but are you seeing these all kind of tracking for some of these innovative approaches? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately, you know, they're all leading to us getting more trees into landscapes. Um, and then that the main issue becomes around permanence. How do we continue to manage and, and guarantee those trees are going to stay there um, and those ecosystem services are going to be performed? And so um, that's where I think the Climate Forward methodology has an interesting opportunity to take the FMU units, the, 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 the forward mitigation units, and then convert them to the traditional units, the CRT yeah. units over time. And I think that's really where there's a really interesting opportunity for corporations to make these investments up front, um, where, where, where the project makes sense. And then as they make the claim, possibly make that conversion to the, to the ex post kind of unit that where the, where the removal is already taken place. Um, I think if, if Arbor Day were to do a, a support projects like this, we would, we would want to see that additional step probably be taken um, in, in the project. Yeah, yeah and, a, and a lot of the projects that we're looking at as well, and I know probably Lisa is too, they all have permanent conservation easements on them. Uh, federal permanent conservation easements are put on them to, get, to assure that they're going to be there. So not the 30 year or the 20 year, they're permanent. And it means that any exchange of ownership of those, of those uh, reforested acres are always in that permanent conservation easement. So it's those kinds of uh, mechanisms that I, I think are gonna be really important. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting opportunity too right now because we've, had, we've been forced to focus on ecosystems that trees grow quickly, so the Southeast, um, mm -hmm. to make the economics work for the carbon credits. And I think, you know, Lisa, you know, projects like yours in California where maybe trees don't grow quite as quickly have not been, you know, been able to be included in the traditional frameworks because of just the, the sequestration rates being lower and the price per ton not being high enough to validate that. But I think, you know, with the, the permanence that is kind of guaranteed with public lands and just the need in general to restore public lands, um, I think this is a really interesting opportunity perhaps for, for public institutions to kind of start getting more in the carbon markets. Yeah. Agree. Ah. Uh. We are at the end of our hour, uh, so so if it's fine with the panelists, I, I can go ahead and and wrap up the webinar. Um, thank you very very much to all of you for this fantastic discussion. Um, we we knew we had assembled an amazing panel, and and we truly did uh, from this conversation. So thank you very much to all of you. Uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, going back and listening to this webinar again or if you had colleagues who missed it we will be posting a recording of the webinar here on youtube at this address um i mentioned at the beginning that this is the fifth webinar in our necw virtual series and we've been having them kind of in a rapid fire style uh every week and now we're going to pace out and have them about once a month so Stay tuned for future announcements on upcoming uh, webinars under this series. And then um, just to bring this to a close, one final note from us. 
at NACW, we very strongly believe in bringing all voices to the table because we know that it takes collaboration to truly address climate change and have an impact. And you may have noticed that the speakers today all came from different perspectives and had different voices on this topic. Uh, likewise, uh, at the beginning, Craig had mentioned the sponsors and exhibitors for NECW. And we would also like to thank others who have joined in, spon in supporting the conference because it takes more than just the sponsors and exhibitors to support the conference, get word out about it, and, and just feed into this really strong community that we have for NACW. So as a closing note, we would like to thank not only the sponsors and exhibitors, but also our media partners and our supporting organizations. Um, so thank you to all of those people. And again, thank you, PJ, Lisa, Anna, and Jeremy. Thank you for joining and really engaging in this fantastic and informative discussion. Thanks for including us. There's more to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take care, all of you. Thank Bye. you. You too. Bye.